finance minister's full budget for fiscal year 2024-25 is in some ways remarkable. Remarkable because normally before the election, you make very high projections of revenue. You make allowance for a lot of expenditure to appease the electorate. And post-budget, the reality kicks in. In this budget, what is remarkable is most of the projections made pre-election, they are retained, except that the revenues actually have increased. Expenditure, while they have to some extent increased the expenditure, most of the revenue increase has actually gone to meet the fiscal deficit, reduce the fiscal deficit. So before the election, it was a very disciplined budget without any extra short-term welfare measures. Post-election, it's equally disciplined. Therefore, the remarkable feature of this budget is the fiscal path of rectitude, fiscal discipline, fiscal consolidation, FRBM Act implementation is well on course. The revenues actually have increased because of RBA's extra dividends and so on and so forth. Instead of 30.01 lakh crores estimated as revenues in the interim budget, now they have gone to 31.29 lakh crores, about 1 lakh 28,000 crores extra. But if you take the deficit, the fiscal deficit has been reduced from what was estimated to be 16.85 lakh crores in the interim budget to now 16.13 lakh crores. There's a reduction of about 72,000 crores of deficit. The rest of it has gone to some more expenditure, mostly revenue expenditure. Therefore, the government deserves the full marks, the finance minister deserves full marks for fiscal discipline. In a country where in most states fiscal discipline has gone for a six, the union government is really continuing the path of fiscal discipline. You take the debt ratio, they're actually planning to reduce the debt GDP ratio over the coming years. Fiscal deficit has become 4.9% as opposed to the projections before the election of 5.1%. Instead of increasing the debt, there's actually a reduction in the debt. And in the next few years, we're well on course to having a fiscal, much more fiscal balance and healthy finances at the union level. The other thing remarkable about the budget is there is a long-term roadmap for India's economic growth. Nine priority areas have been chosen. Some of the important areas have really gained significant attention. You take agriculture for productivity and resilience. Long overdue, very welcome. I think a, an amount of about 1.58 lakh crores 1.52 lakh crores is allocated for agricultural activities. The devil is in the detail. There are some missed opportunities, but the emphasis is very welcome. Similarly, you take the manufacturing and services and employment and skills. Enormous emphasis is given to employment and skill generation, promotion of internships, training, and incentives based on the employment generation, both for the employee and the employer. A lot is being done, a lot more needs to be done. We should welcome this emphasis because the government has realized that employment generation for about maybe 10 lakh people joining the job market every month in the country is the most important issue plaguing the nation. Without creating adequate avenues for earning for these people, we will not see political stability or economic growth or social cohesion in the long term. So that emphasis is very much welcome. And if you take the manufacturing and services, particularly small and medium enterprises, a remarkable list of incentives have been provided to make their life easier for them to grow and significant reforms in terms of labor laws and many other things already in place, they're being accelerated or furthered. All of the sectors that are proposed are extremely sound and welcome. There's a lot of granularity in the budget a lot of specificity, a lot of detail. Obviously, the government, various departments have done a lot of homework. They're looking at the long term. Andhra Pradesh and Bihar got special dispensation, AP because of the Division Act, the Andhra Pradesh formation, Telangana formation time, the division of Andhra Pradesh. Many commitments were made by law and in parliament. Many of them are now given the renewed commitment and Hopefully that they will all be in place, the capital for Andhra Pradesh, Polvaram project, 
Vizag, Chennai Industrial Corridor, Hyderabad, Bangalore Industrial Corridor, and many infrastructure projects and so on and so forth. Similarly, Bihar, the poorest of Indian states among the large states, deserves all the assistance that they can get, and a lot of projects are in annual. Similarly, for Eastern India. There are some other issues that deserve recognition and uh, they, they definitely must be lauded. Apart from the fiscal discipline, tax reform has gone further. I'm sure the capital markets are a little cowed down now because of the increase in the long-term capital gains tax. But it's not unfair. If the wealthy people who invest in the capital market get, get to pay, 10% as tax on the long-term capital gains. But if the ordinary hard-working employees and workers, they pay 15, 20, 25, 30% on their hard-earned income, it's not very fair. While we must encourage savings and investment in capital, there must be also taxation on capital gains. So 12.5% from 10% earlier is not a phenomenal increase, it's reasonable. It's on par with many rich countries. In fact, in rich countries, oftentimes the capital gains tax is about 20%. And therefore, I welcome it personally. The land records improvement and many other rural improvement programs are very welcome because unless the land is taken care of, the, the title is very clear. As Hernando de Soto said, land is the source of all kinds of credit system. Land is what gives security to the owner. Unless the land records and land title are clear, economic activity will come to a standstill after a certain point. One other good thing that the finance minister indicated, though it's not part of the budgetary allocations, the NPS versus OPS controversy. Old pension system, unfunded long-term liability, which is index-linked pension, not only price index-linked, but also wage index-linked, is a disaster for the country. Therefore, the NPS that has come into being, the contributory pension scheme, where the employer and employee, they both contribute to the fund from where they draw the pension is absolutely necessary. But some of the demands of employees are reasonable. They want a long-term assurance, therefore some kind of a guaranteed pension system for which the government will assume, assume responsibility. But by providing the resources now, not kicking the ball down the road, transferring the burden to the next generation, is very welcome. The finance minister hinted at that, the states should emulate. The political parties must all come together and stop the very dangerous game of offering old pension system, unfunded system, burdening the next generation all over the country in states. I hope this will actually put a stop to that and protect the future of our children. A lot of steps are taken in taxation for enhancing the competitiveness of industry and export promotion. All these are welcome and necessary. There are some missed opportunities. Manriga, the Rural Employment Guarantee Act, could have been extended to the farmers for long-term crops like horticulture, etc., so that crop diversification and moving towards the crops where the demand is higher rather than simply producing rice and wheat should have been encouraged. Similarly, for water harvesting, contour bending, etc., the Manriga funds could have been utilized. It's a low-hanging fruit. There's no additional expenditure involved. Hopefully, the government of India will address this in the short and medium term. Similarly, the storage in agriculture is a major problem. Our total storage capacity is less than 10% of the production in agriculture, and most of it is utilized only for the food grains. What we need is storage for the non-perishable commodities where the price is volatile, like cotton, turmeric, chili, and the perishable crops where storage is absolutely vital. We all know about the tomato and the onion, how prices fluctuate. Storage with assured credit, pledging the stock available, which significantly reduce volatility, help both the producer and the consumer. It's a low-hanging fruit. So allocation of resources for storage, both in private sector and public sector, and with public-private partnership, and credit linkage are very easy to administer and to employ, implement. Hopefully, the government will take notice and do something about it. Similarly, retail chains, there's a policy instituted by the UPA government under Dr. Manmohan Singh, but somehow it was never taken seriously subsequently. We must encourage the global retail chains to come in so that the market chain is compressed. 
so that the farmer gets about 60-70% of the end price of the consumer, so that the logistics chain is improved. Lots of investment flows into agricultural and allied sectors. Processing takes place and export markets open up. Even today, our total agricultural exports are only the order of about $40, $45 billion. We can easily do $100, $150 billion, given the fact that India has about 11% of the world's agricultural land with excellent climatic conditions. We are simply not utilizing the opportunities fully. One of the missed opportunities, while a lot of emphasis is given to urbanization in terms of big cities and peri-urban areas, if you want to accommodate a large number of low-wage earners in the country from rural areas, they cannot be an only answer of distant migration to big cities with low skills and low income. There have to be many small, small towns developed close to their habitats, urban amenities in rural areas, in situ urbanization so that low skilled people can be absorbed on a large uh, scale. All the government has to do is provide basic infrastructure, water supply, transport, rainwater, uh, stormwater drainage and sewerage system have town, town planning system properly in place and have first rate connectivity. Rest of it, private sector will take care. Many people with low skills can be accommodated there in small jobs where that small income will be more than adequate compared to living in big cities and they are not dislocated from their cultural and social milieu. They have a support system. We have seen what happened at the height of the COVID pandemic when millions of migrants low-skilled low migrants from rural areas, they had to go back to their villages with nothing to show to support to them. We cannot allow that to happen. If you want inclusive growth, small town development must be an integral part of that. These are some of the missed opportunities. All in all, I think it's an excellent budget, a budget for fiscal discipline, long-term growth, and wealth creation. And we should welcome it, and I hope some of the missed opportunities will be taken note of and we will address them in the coming months.